I know that I am uh, definitely working with a, a bunch of season experts, uh, professors and the like uh, here. So it's very different uh, audience, but kind of the same thing. Uh, and so I will tell you that. Uh, um, so if you've heard it before or first of all, I am not a historian. So please, if, if I make a mistake, raise your hand and be like, Dean, that was dumb. Don't say that again. This is correct. So don't be embarrassed about that. Um, and then the second thing is, is that this is, I would consider this like uh, almost a sales pitch uh, for my uh, kind of passion for an area of the Eastern Roman Empire that is largely, I would say, kind of forgotten to history in, in so far as uh, you know, it's not something that's as well known as some of the big names uh, in the full empire. And really, it's worth knowing. And it's it's worth trying to understand and, and try to, you know, as collectors of ancient coins, we 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 like certain things. I like Alexander the Great. I'm going to collect a bunch of that. And then you go on to the next thing. And so this is kind of my sales pitch to another thing for you to collect. And um, so that that's really what this is guided at. Uh, to me, uh, Eastern Roman or Byzantine coins are, are very underappreciated. They're very undervalued. Um, there is some beautiful coins. Obviously, the bronzes are not uh, what we would consider beautiful, uh, but they are historically important. And I would, you know, encourage you guys, one, um, if any of this starts, you know, sparks a little bit of interest in you, one is to try and find out as much about the history as you can. Uh, you know, two places that I can think of particularly that I like to share with people on YouTube are uh, Kings and Generals, which is a fantastic history channel, um, which is strictly videos about um, history and battles and all of that. Uh, and then the second place is History March, which is another one. Uh, both have pretty uh, uh, extensive histories of, of the Macedonian Renaissance and uh, Basil II. Uh, and so there's a lot of information out there to be had. I'm just trying to connect the dots for you. So you have some, uh, maybe uh, something that'll perk up and, and give you a new area to collect. So with that being said, before I uh, kick this completely off, I did want to normally behind my head, um, I have a picture of Basil II, uh, but I brought him down so you guys could see. Obviously, uh, there there's a lot of great artwork from that time period, uh, particularly Basil. Uh, because a lot of his history is kind of torrid and and uh, visually interesting to look at. Uh, so there's a lot of neat artwork from that time period. And I, I like I like those as much as I like the Renaissance paintings of Julius Caesar. Uh, I think they're they're pretty neat. So that being said, uh, I will make this uh, within the time constraint and try to uh, uh, be as helpful as I can. But again, if you know something or or want to share, please feel free to jump in and and uh, start up a conversation. So with that being said, this is the Macedonian Renaissance. And for those of you guys who I'm sure you guys know, but most of you guys don't know, uh, is about a 200 year period in which the Byzantine Empire uh, or the Eastern Roman Empire uh, had a, a strong resurgence, uh, kind of the empire strikes back uh, for a long period of time from the time of Heracles and the rise of the uh, Islam. Uh, they had a serious ranking uh, from the, from Justinian's uh, main growth down to what it had become in the 800s, early 800s. Uh, it was really what they would consider the dying man. Uh, and so the empire was shrinking. They were uh, in financial dire straits. Uh, and this represents, you know, about 200 years of a turnaround period that the Eastern Rona empire really made a strong return onto the scene. So, Dean, uh, so go ahead. Before you go on, Dean, let me just ask everybody a, a quick question. So I'm sharing the screen. Are you guys seeing Dean as just like a little video with uh, the PowerPoint as the large part of the screen? Yeah. I just want to make sure. Yes? Yep. Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay, okay yep. good. Excellent. And then, Dean, uh, when you want me to switch the slide, just say next slide. Next slide. Okay. So, so. Basil II, probably in the top five emperors of all time for me, um, didn't start out strong, really had kind of a, a rough going early on. We'll talk a little bit about that later. 
Um, but in my mind, you know, and, and we have to kind of quantify this stuff in our, or classify this stuff in our mind. Think about Julius Caesar, the conqueror who went to Gaul, Gaul um, and conquered Gaul and was very successful. And you kind of look at the other side of that and, you know, where some call it uh, a Gallic Holocaust. Um, so we'll classify that, um, you know, because there's still, you know, feelings, negative and positive, particularly in this case, if you have Bulgarian ancestry, um, there's probably some some people that really don't like him. Uh, and I would say that there are there is at least one guy that's named the Roman Slayer um, from Bulgaria. So it was kind of equal. So anyway, but one of the things that I like to point out at the beginning, this is his epitaph. And uh, um, what's mostly neat about this, <laughs> what's what's my favorite quote, uh, you know, of this. Uh, but I, Basil, born to the purple, place my to tomb on the site of Hebdomon, and I sabotaged from the endless toils which I accepted in battles and which I endured, for nobody saw my spear at rest, from when the king of heavens called me autocrater of the earth and senior emperor. And I really like, for nobody saw my spear at rest, because that is absolutely the truth with this guy. Uh, spent most of his adult life going into Bulgaria, we're going into Syria and the Levant and uh, reclaiming territory uh, for the empire. And I, I just think that's really like a badass statement um, to put on your, your tomb. Uh, next slide, Eric. Okay. So, you know, again, we'll, we'll take this as a point in time, but we'll say that, uh, you know, for all of us collectors, Byzantine coins are, um, I would say an afterthought, uh, probably along the lines of Sasanians or or Parthians, uh, not necessarily considered uh, the greatest works of art. Um, and so, you know, the value and there there is actually quite a few. Right. I mean, there, there's a lot of Solidus coins out there. There's a lot of um, bronze, tons of bronze coins that you can get. But in an era of where I feel like there's still a significant gap between what's available um, and, you know, and what people's knowledge is um, on ancient coins, where I expect in my mind, and maybe I'm 100% off base, I expect that some of these coins that we can still buy for two, three, and four grand now are going to go keep going up. Really nice versions of some of this stuff. That's in my mind. Maybe I'm maybe I'm totally off base, but I feel like there's still some room to grow on the ancient in terms of values. When people get their minds around what they can collect, I still think that there's still a lot, a lot uh, of opportunity for the prices of those coins to go up. So this is an alternative. This is something that is not extremely valuable uh, in terms of the marketplace, but that doesn't stop you from being able to collect at this point. And and uh, you know, I don't want to call it investment. All of us know that coin collecting is not an investment and it's tough. Um, but but this to me is a perfect um, perfect opportunity, a perfect time to really kind of hone in a collection of Byzantine coins. And in my mind, I still think there's still some value to those coins uh, in the future. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is kind of my sales pitch, and I like to bring up the seventeen ninety four dollar um, because I think Heritage just put out a video on that, and it was ten million dollars. And you know, one of my favorite things they one of six. You know, uh, one of my favorite things is you know in my head, what would I do with ten million dollars with coins, right? I mean, what would I what would I buy instead? And I could fill just I mean I could fill a vault with the stuff that I buy, uh, but again, that's that's the nature of the business. That's American style, right? We like our things and we like them perfect and we like them slabbed and we like them very expensive. And so that's, again, why I feel like, you know, the more people get to know ancient coins, the the more value there will be added to them. Go ahead. Here we go. Okay, a lot of words. Apologize for that. Um, this is kind of a breakdown. I did submit or I sent a kind of a hand uh, a handout with, with some kind of the very specifics about ancient uh, Byzantine coins and and you know how they're struck and what the the metallic value is, um, just like everything else with the the Macedonian uh, 
renaissance the the amount of gold in the coin is higher than it had been uh the amount of silver in the available coins uh is higher um it's a better quality coin it's not struck under duress um it is in a time period of advancement uh moving the empire forward so the quality um except for the bronze which we all know um tends to be better um and uh you know the overall appearance the the quality of the gold all of that kind of stuff is much better um but also on the other side of that is if you're not you're not in the 500 to a thousand dollar price range there's plenty of coins that you can buy in the 40 to 50 dollar price range which also is very uh makes it very exciting area to collect go ahead and these are some examples uh the uh, the one on the left is Basil the first. Um, I actually uh, got one of those from uh, Mike Cast Photos collection, and uh, you know, absolutely love that that coin, Christ on the first. A lot of Christian iconography, and all of these coins uh, represents representation of Christ. Um, and the bronze on the right is of the same time period, uh, just not uh, you know. A lot of those are kind of anonymous as they stretch over periods of time. Uh, but same consistent Christ on the obverse and then the emperor uh, and some of the uh, the link or the legend on the reverse. Um, I'm going to, even though I own a number of these, I'm going to uh, uh, completely mispronounce and forget the name of the silver coin at the bottom. Somebody want to jump in and help me out. It is a What does it call it? Right, anyway, we'll skip that and we'll go to the the gold. Obviously, it's a, and this is another one that I'll have problems pronouncing it. Uh, a nomisma histamon, right? A gold coin of that time period. Uh, beautiful iconography of Jesus on the obverse, and I think that's Constantine the seventh on the reverse. Um, and Milarison is what I was thinking of with the silver coin. Uh, and that's probably pronounced absolutely wrong. Another example to me of a coin that's probably undervalued, the iconography, the the style is not what you would call like, you know, great Greek or anything like that. But to me, they're, they're most of them are kind of rehammered, uh, taken, you know, obviously they didn't have silver mines at the time or they didn't have near as many. So a lot of that silver was from, uh, other areas that they brought in and either melted down or rehammered. Um, so there's a number of those that are out there in various condition, and I think they're all really neat. Um, and uh, that's Nikephorus Focus the second, uh, but they're all to me very sharp, uh, very interesting pieces of history that uh, are easy to enjoy. And move on to the next slide. Okay, so we're talking about what did uh, what did Eastern Rome Roman Empire look like. Uh, so this is at the time of uh, uh, Nikephorus Focus the first, um, and uh, obviously the the what we're used to seeing the Roman Empire is quite a bit uh, smaller than it had been. One of the neat things that I like to point out is uh, Crete, um, or I'm sorry, Cyprus uh, um, was a shared. It was shared between uh, Caliphate and the Byzantine Empire, which is not. Uh, very common, uh, obviously, in history, so that's interesting. Uh, but the, the area has shrunk su significantly from Justinian's reign and has uh, decreased with time. And you go to the next slide, and you can see. So these Macedonian emperors did a significant amount of work to not only bring Bulgaria um, and a lot of these the southern portion of Italy um, but also uh, parts of the Levant, the Syria, some important pieces of history or areas of history that have traditionally been uh, Roman controlled. And so there was a huge um, uh, increase in territory and, uh, I guess, respect in the region for uh, the Eastern Roman emperors at the time. So that that's really what we're talking about, um, a period of strong, significant growth, not only um uh, you know, financially, but it, and in terms of space that they occupy, but also in terms of knowledge and growth. And, and this is around the same time period that the Eastern Rome, Romans uh, shared their classics with uh, some of the caliphates. 
And you would say that this is kind of the onset of not only the Eastern Roman um, kind of Renaissance, but also the Muslim Renaissance when when Islam became the center of creativity and uh, uh, art uh, from that time period. And so this is a this is a era in which a lot of things moved forward that had been stagnant since the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Uh, next slide. So these are the these are the the big four, and I I like, you know, there's other guys. Romanus II was not a bad emperor. There's a lot of emperors in this time period, uh, for the traditional Byzantine reasons of somebody being appointed domesticos of the East, um, and feeling like he should be emperor, and then he takes a stab at being emperor, becomes emperor, and then the next guy that's promoted uh, to that position. Um, ends up taking over as emperor so there's a just a long strain of that but these are the the these are the the money guys the guys that had a lot of success started with basil the first nicophorus focus uh john samiskis and then basil uh and they all have pretty badass nicknames uh the only one that that i you know i like to throw on here um <laughs> the only one that, that that's missing here is michael the third the drunkard um, which uh, who is Basil had killed, but I think that's also a good nickname. If you're if you're going down in history uh, as a drunkard, as your nickname, you are a legendary drinker. That is something to be beholden of. So anyway, so lots of good nicknames from that time period. Again, a lot of reason to like it. Um, so let's kind of go on a timeline and try to uh, walk you through kind of what happens, right? So this is a shortened version of the. Uh, what happened? Uh, so Basil the first. We'll talk a little bit about him. He's kind of, kind of the um, Max Maximinius Thrax of the time period. Uh, so he kind of comes from nothing, becomes a uh, friend of the emperors, and then kills the emperor, which you know is traditional. Um, and then uh, so he had a lot of success, um, kind of reorganized the empire, and then. And, his successors, he dies, uh, leaves it to Leo the Fourth. Then they walk everything that Basil the First did got pretty much undone um, in the time period between him and uh, Nicephorus Focus. Uh, and so, but he's still important to history. Uh, after uh, at Romanus II, uh, who is Basil the Second's father, uh, died in 963. Uh, in a very interesting period of time. We had two, uh, what we would call guardians of the empire, empire between Nicephorus and Focus, or Nicephorus Focus and John Samiskis take over as emperor, but on the promise that they would become, they would leave the empire to him uh, when he became of age. Uh, and so traditionally, you would think of that as something that wouldn't happen, or it's a trick to try and get that position and then kill the kid. But not in this case. These these guys were either had designs on handing off the empire to Basil II or um, had not gotten far enough in their plans to assassinate him and then take the reign for their for themselves. Um, and then uh, the end of the kind of the, the change is Basil II uh, took over as full kind of emperor in 976. He had a regent pre prior to that. Um, and uh, he was empowered till 1025. So we talk about Augustus, we talk about Constantine the Great. One of the longest reigning emperors in history is Basil II. Um, so technically from 963 to 1025 is how long he was emperor. Now he obviously had regents, but that's that's a pretty significant stretch of time uh, for somebody to be in charge of an empire. Next slide, please. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about Basil I. Uh, Basil, uh, born to uh, peasant parents, he was, uh, I think there are various stories on how he came to power, but he was known as a great wrestler, um, a, a guy that could break any horse um, that was put in front of him. Um, and so uh, he was brought to the court of, of uh, Michael III, um, and Michael III recognized that he had a lot of potential, and so he kind of made him uh, his number two, and then he made him co-emperor, and then he paid for it um, by being assassinated. And uh, 
not to say that that's you know the right thing to do, but uh, uh, obviously uh, Basil had some success in which the Empire grew it. So this is this is how it goes. Um, but anyway, that's how he came to power. So a lowly stable boy to emperor in a very short period of time. Uh, but once he achieved power, he knew what to do with it. Um, so what, one of the major things that he did, he was the first emperor since Constance II uh, to pursue uh, an act of policy of restoring the whole empire, right? Um, and so that that kind of, you know, other points in history, there had been flirting with that, but, uh, you know, particularly with uh, Irene or Irene, uh, however you want to say it, um, there had been points, but there they had, uh, Basil did work with um, the Holy Roman Emperor um, in certain strategic operations, some successful, some others. Um, he, uh, what's it called, uh, considered the second Justinian, helping create uh, uh, Basil. Yeah, sorry, I'm not great with uh, Greek, uh, to simplify and adapt the code. So kind of similar to adapt and and kind of bring into current conditions the code of Justinian. Um, and then he had a series of successes um, in uh, either Italy or in the neighborhood of Constantinople. Um, so those were also notable in certain bat battles. Uh, but then it was the big kind of crushing defeat was losing Sicily uh, and Sicily having, um, you know, uh, some major trade implications and pirate problems that all of the islands represented at that point. Um, that was a significant loss to the empire. Uh, and so that that happened during Basil the first uh, reign. So let's flash forward just so we know a little bit about the guys that uh, are important. Nikephorus Focus, uh, part of a huge Focus clan. Um, you'll hear that name throughout history of uh, particularly uh, the Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, very powerful family, uh, very successful. Uh, so he he was already kind of died in the the blue or or with a silver spoon, um, but he was somebody that was given uh, domesticos or had made his way. Uh, as a general uh, and had a lot of success. Um, and then obviously it doesn't hurt when Bardas, his father, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, helps move him through the ranks, which is traditional. We'll hear more from Bardas later. Um, he had a successful conquest of Crete, right? Um, and that's a very significant, again, there was a lot of particularly bad uh, pirating going on, sabotage, uh, uh, and it had a great, a uh, significant impact on the Byzantine Empire and and their ability to one have a peaceful empire, but two to uh, have a stable economy. Uh, that was a big, big, big deal. Um, captured uh, Tarsus, um, and then uh, uh, we start to kind of go into the east. Right, we start uh, a lot of uh, interactions with the caliphates uh, starts at this point. Um, which is significant because a lot of a lot of uh, Romans and um, other empires had very little success against the the caliphates at this point. Um, it was generally uh, unsuccessful to say the least. Uh, and so it was kind of a turning point in which uh, you know the Eastern Romans started to have some success and push back uh, and Nicophorus was, one of the strategos, strategos, uh, the guys in charge of uh, uh, kind of bringing that area back into the empire. Uh, lost Sicily, uh, but then also had uh, some very good success. Uh, can't uh, captured Antioch, and there's an interesting story about that. Uh, his his general who uh, was in charge of it uh, kind of took the the. Uh, Antioch without his permission. His name, name was Michael Bortzies, Um, and that be that Michael Bortzies got uh lost his position. And so kind of a, created a rift between him and John Zemiskis. Um, and then unfortunately, John Zemiskis uh did what what Basil I had done and uh assassinated him. Uh so that's where you can see there down below. But certainly a successful guy, laid the groundwork, helped organize 
uh, the Byzantine Empire to be successful, all while he was technically regent for um, Basil II and uh, had moved up, but very successful. Uh, the next gentleman, if you flip the slide, uh, Eric, uh, John Zemiskis, uh, John the First, uh, another born to another uh, fluent family, um, and uh, and then also moved married the important Scleros family, which is uh, somebody another name that'll come up uh, during Basil the Second's tenure. Um, again, a guy that had a lot of success in the East, but also. Um, had some success uh, up north. So he there had been a number of times that the Kievan Rus um, had come down uh, either into Bulgaria um, or uh, uh, near the Byzantine Empire to you know try to get land for themselves or just to pillage. Um, I think Svetislav, who was the czar of the Kievan Rus at that time, um, was very successful initially against the Bulgarians and the Romans. Um, but then they worked out a peace treaty, and that was through uh, John Zemiskis, because John Zemiskis was able to uh, kind of strike back against the, I forget what they call him, the snow leopard, Svetislav. Um, but anyway, had uh, very, a good success, uh, helped put the uh, the Rus forces from Thrace, um, and then defeated Grand Prince Svetislav of Kiev and negotiated a truce. Um Again, a very, uh, very successful emperor um, and did have a, a very good track record. Died suddenly at 51, uh, which I think was a surprise uh, one because Basil was not ready yet at 976, but also uh, was just turning 18, honestly. And then, um, you know, was actually having doing a full tour of his um empire at the time and so you know looking to expand looking to stabilize um but unfortunately unfortunately his life was cut short and so as he dies uh the the son of romanus the second basil the second is um crowned he is um born in the purple as we say right uh, he was uh, born to Romanus II and to Theophano. Theophano is not somebody I really mentioned previous to this, but I believe she married uh, John Samiskis, um, and I believe also Nikephor's focus. Uh, but anyway, the the mother of Basil II to keep the lineage. Uh, as, uh, what's it called? When John Samiski died, suddenly, as is traditional in Roman history, suddenly a lot of people woke up and said, hey, I can be an emperor. I'm obviously uh, a very successful general, so I'm just going to go ahead and call myself emperor and tell you to stop. Uh, at the time, uh, Basil still had kind of a regency, although he was developing into himself. Um, his, uh, oh, and I can't think of his name off the top of my head, uh, Basil Lacopanos. Uh, there you go, uh, was was the leader of the administration and, of course, caused some kind of inner turmoil because they had two different mindsets on where they wanted to um, take the empire. Uh, one of the things that uh, Basil did that was very successful um, is he, uh, what's it called, uh, gave his sister off as a hostage to uh, Vladimir the first of Kiev and uh, in trade for that and other concessions they uh, gave Basil a force of 6,000 um, of their finest troops that would be a consistent or constant through the empire uh, till the fall of Constantinople in 1204 uh, and then some form of it beyond uh, so the Varangian guard really became kind of I don't want to say the you know, kind of Basil's quick response force, right? The the guys that really, um, you know, put the nails <laughs> or put the screws to people. And so that was uh, very successful and helped them throughout uh, kind of the rest of the Eastern Roman Empire's uh, tenure. Uh, we mentioned there were claimants to the throne. Um, there are lots of twists and turns in these stories. Uh, we don't have enough time uh, to cover all of that, but you have uh, Bardas Scleros, Bardas Focus, and Basil Lecapenos all vying for the emperorship. 
and all trying to uh, kind of take over for Basil. Uh, in the end, none of them were particularly gifted uh, strategy guys or or generals, um, so they were easily defeated. Um, and uh, uh, so he maintained his title. I think it was by the time of 986, he had solidified himself as the emperor. He had done um, one expedition uh, off into Bulgaria that was a huge failure, um, and he was almost killed himself. Uh, so that broke that brought Bardas Focus and Bardas Scleros back to try and uh, reclaim the emperor empire. Uh, they were killed or or uh, were uh, eliminated from competition because of that, and uh, so he was free to reign as the single emperor. Uh, you can see that he uh, was very successful conquest. Con uh, successful conquest of Bulgaria, Crimea, Crimea, and Georgia. Um, very successful emperor. So you can turn to the next slide. Okay, so really the culmination of this is a neat battle. Again, there's a lot of opportunity for you guys to uh, look at this in uh, your own time and, and try to understand. But this is one of, I would say, and it kind of represents who... Basil was, in some senses, uh, he's kind of a dichotomy of character, uh, both good and bad. The, I'll tell the, the story, but then on the other side of that coin, most people, he absorbed Bulgaria into the empire, treated them the same as Romans, um, was very as good to them as, um, you know, the regular Romans were. So he had kind of an interesting behavior with him. At the same time, he would, you know, sack an entire city and make a um, you know, may make a very pointed argument or pointed uh, statement as to whether you should rise up against him. Um, this battle uh, particular was uh, led by Basil II and Nikephorus Zepius. Um, uh, there was potentially as many as uh, 45,000 uh, Byzantine soldiers, but I think a, a lot of that is kind of overdrawn. Uh, it's very interesting, this battle, because uh generally the romans have the lower count than the next guy but here the bulgarians actually have less troops um and uh they samuel who was the czar of bulgaria at the time czar being short for caesar um was the guy that basil had been battling for the better part of 20 years at that time and this is kind of the cul uh culmination of that um so the result of that battle, which is, you know, uh, probably one of the more interesting things that have happened in history, um, that uh, uh, their their win was so complete that they took 15,000 prisoners, um, divided the Basil divided the prisoners into groups of 100 men, blinded 99 uh, each group and left one group, the, the the hundredth guy with one eye so he could find his way back uh, to the capital of Bulgaria. Uh, there are a number actually in the background here, There's that's actually a, a painting of that. Um, after that, uh, he was he got the nickname Bulgar Slayer. Um, you can see why. Now there's obviously mixed storytelling about whether this actually happened, whether it happened at the volume or the extent that it did. Um, a lot of people say it was a thousand, uh, but either way, obviously a very potent uh, defeat and uh, message sent. Uh, the legend has it that uh, Samuel, who was the czar of Russia or czar of uh, Bulgaria at the time, uh, when they returned, he saw that and immediately had a heart attack and died. Um, so that's kind of the the legend behind it. Again, I, you know, not necessarily what actually happened. But the legend is significant, and and quite frankly, the um, the entire uh, kind of legend around Basil is significant and very interesting. Uh, so that's kind of a you know a, a a breakdown into their their lives and and uh, you know a little bit about them. There's so much more information. This is a particularly well written about time period of time. As I said, it was kind of the the Renaissance or the the building back where things were recorded accurately or, or at least as much as you could. Um, so there's a lot of good information on the time. There's a lot of good books 
and a lot of good places to learn more about this. But as far as a um, interesting time in the Byzantine um, Empire, uh, as far as I go, this is probably uh, as good as it gets. You want to flip it, Eric? So to sum up and and uh, really kind of put a bow on this, really, uh, there are this being one of many, there are many, many, many different areas that you can start to collect and still be able to afford and still not be priced out of the market. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, uh, to me, this is, this is a, you know, this is a neat, neat period of time with a lot of things happening. Um, and so for your average collector, uh, you can still afford to, uh, compete in this area. You can still afford to bid on coins from this era. Even the gold coins, uh, even the nicest of gold coins um, are uh, still affordable, still less than $1,000. Unless, you know, uh, Theofano or or Irene is on a, on a coin, they, uh, they don't call for that much. And so you can select them all in this case and uh, still be, uh, still have a little bit of money in your pocket. And so that's, that's kind of the point of the presentation is where do, if I can't afford, uh, you know, all of the different types of Lysimachus, um, then, you know, I have to, I have to go somewhere. And this is the, this is, this is to me as good area as any. And I think that is it. That is my presentation. I tried to keep it within the time constraints and hurry over some stuff. Um, but I appreciate you guys uh, letting me talk for a little bit. You know, obviously it hurts my heart every time I have to talk out loud, but uh, um, I do have, you guys can uh, feel free to keep the presentation. Um, I have uh, another uh, handout that I gave, uh, but also uh, if you guys have any questions or any, you know, want any insight into, uh, you know, why this is interesting, uh, feel free to message or ask away if you have questions. Not all at once, guys. If anyone has any questions for Dean, um, now's the time. It it was a good presentation. So, um, you know, I'm not a historian. Um, I think we know one of the group who is, but um, yeah, I'll leave the floor open to anyone. Hey, Dean, it's Mike Gasvoda. And, oh, uh, no. Yeah, I, I have to say that was a very enjoyable presentation. Well done and uh, and congrats to you because it is, uh, it is a, a rather complex subject and it is widely uh, available and collectible. And I agree with, with most everything you said. I, uh, I would say that uh, if you're going to look at this, the one inexpensive and easy book that you can get to help you learn a lot about it is Sears' book on Byzantine. And and of course, if you see what we how we catalog or how most everybody else catalogs, you'll see an SB number, and uh, that means Sears Byzantine. And uh, you know, I I, I like uh, the way Sear writes, and I think that uh, it's a, it's an inexpensive way for you to to look up an emperor, for example, and and understand who he was and and what his coinage was all about. But uh, but well done, Dean. I enjoyed it. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it, especially from the guy who's uh, one of my most proud Byzantine coins comes from your collection. 